And I'm very honoured today to uh, be joined by my fellow panelists to discuss about um, the issue of the high seas. Uh, I'm going to borrow a word from uh, Andrew Norton, our director, who said this is once in a lifetime opportunity. So for many of you, of course, who know about the high seas, um, the way the ocean is governed, of course, according to the law of the sea, uh, we have up to, quote unquote, 200 nautical miles from the coast, which is labeled as the um, areas within national jurisdiction. Uh, but anything beyond 200 nautical miles remains largely ungoverned. There is no any sort of a global govern, governance me mechanism out there to enable us to govern uh, the issue of biodiversity conservation or fisheries, etc., uh, in uh, areas beyond national jurisdiction. However, there is an opportunity here where the UN has started a, a, a process amongst member states to negotiate uh, the term, um, if to develop a, an international legally binding instrument to govern the high seas. Uh, and the negotiation among member states of the UN has started. And um, in that um, uh, process, Anka and myself, we have the least enviable task. We both represent member state in the negotiation process. I represent Eritrea uh, in the negotiation process and Anka is one of the lead negotiator from the French government as well. I promised Anka that I was going to make a disclaimer in saying that whatever we say here is in our personal capacity and does not reflect the opinion of our governments, unless stated otherwise. Is that fair? Yes, thank you so much. Yeah. So, in, in, on, in fact, as you have the microphone, uh, do you mind introducing yourself, Anka, uh, briefly? Well, first of all, I would like to thank you very much for this invitation and for this initiative. And uh, uh, bonjour à tous et à toutes, uh, in, in French a little bit. Um, well, uh, very quickly, uh, I've been a practicing lawyer during uh, seven years uh, in the private sector, and I joined after uh, the French Ministry of Environment, so I took the decision to speak about French Ministry of Environment because um, the uh, uh, translation into English it is quite uh, complicated, but I was very happy to see that uh, the transitional uh, ecologic transition has been also translated on my badge. So I, I'm very happy to tell you that I'm from the Ministry of Ecological and Inclusive Transition. So we translated uh, this term, which is very important with the them thematic that we are developing today on blue economy. Um, and uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm here to, to share with you also uh, <coughs> the French uh, positions uh, in the negotiations uh, within the future treaty, but also to give you some uh, ideas about the French prior priorities for G G7 environment, which will take uh, place in France this year, and also to ensure you that the ocean is on the political agenda. For, for France and also for uh, the European Union, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> so you. maybe I will give you back the Thank floor. You. Sure. <laughs> Thank you, Anka. That's a very useful introduction. Thank you very much, uh, Anka. And next to Anka, we have uh, Dr. Ekaterina Popova, who doesn't mind being called Katya. Uh, could you please briefly introduce yourself as well, Katya? Uh, okay, I'm a scientist and I'm an ocean and climate modeler from uh, National Oceanography Centre. And I'm here to give you a lot of scientific evidence which part of the high seas is connected to which part of the coastal zone on what time scale. But unfortunately, I have not a clue of what this legally binding agreement may look like. So I'm here to learn. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Katya. I'll translate that later. <laughs> William, can you just say as well, please? Sure. Uh, hi, my name is William Chen. I am a Canadian Research Chair in um, Global Ocean Sustainability and Global Change. Uh, I'm also a Director of Science for the Nippon Foundation UBC Nervous Program, which tasked um, to predict the future oceans. I'm an ecologist and a fishery scientist by training. And uh, my work uh, focuses a lot on looking at how climate change affects uh, the oceans and fisheries. And um, I've been doing a lot of work of trying to 
uh, look at what the future ocean would be like mm. using scenarios and models. Um, and uh, work quite closely with some of the International Science Policy Forum. Um, for example, I, uh, I'm uh, now a coordinating lead authors for the uh, IPCC Special Report for the Oceans and Cryosphere under the Changing Climate. Um, in, this, in the context of this uh, meeting, um, in collaboration and support by IED and SM, uh, we have been working on uh, looking at um, the changing high seas and the fisheries and the climate change and how some of the uh, future potential um, governance and uh, conservation measures in the high sea may affect and benefit a uh, coastal state. And uh, I'll be talking a, a more about that um, in the panel discussion too. Excellent. Thank you so very much. So as you can see, uh, we're very privileged to have such a distinguished panel uh, with us today. And just a bit of myself, I, I, was, I was trained as a marine <laughs> biologist myself, and I started my career as a marine biologist for a fishery scientist, but I ended up being an economist. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, but also I've worked for my government extensively in the past as well, so hopefully uh, I'll, I'll play a moderator role in terms of you know bridging the science and uh, policy uh, here in this panel in particular. Um, so before I get back to Katya and William, uh, can you succinctly, Anka, back to you, uh, tell how many of you know about the BBNJ process, about the high seas process now? A few. Good. I can assume the rest do not necessarily understand or have a better understanding of the process. So here's the challenge for you, Anka. Can you briefly summarize about the BBNJ process, maybe in two or three minutes? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so I will try to summarize. Um, well, um, as you know, uh, I will start with the Paris Agreement in uh, tw uh, 2015 uh, because I think it's quite important uh, to remind that uh, during the negotiations we have had a lot of difficulties to have in this agreement the term ocean. Why we didn't handle to have terms like water, we managed at the very end to have the, the, the term ocean in the preambular part of this agreement. And uh, even if for some uh, they consider it as a detailed, I think it's quite important message uh, to remind us. And we refer to uh, the fact that we really encourage all states to take concrete measures for uh, the preservation and the sustainable use of the ocean ecosystem. Um, and now I will arrive uh, end of 2015, uh, before the conclusion of the Paris Agreement, uh, we have had an ANGA resolution um, in September 2015. Um, uh, we have uh, obtained a mandate at the level of the UN uh, to develop a legally binding agreement uh, for the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, uh, from which we have the acronym uh, BBNJ. Um, and this uh, mandate um, has been um, a, a result of uh, many years of discussions before, I think, if I'm not wrong, because I arrived in this process only in 2016, but before uh, the discussions on the, on the development of a new instrument um, lasted more than six or eight years, I think, <coughs> before, through working groups, preparatory work. And the idea, uh, not the idea, well, the mandate that we received is to develop um, a new instrument that will complement and will be mutually supportive with the provisions that are already under UNCLOS, which is, as you know, the Constitution of Oceans, which is the, which is the, const, uh, the um, treaty, the, the mother convention, we are saying this in French. Um, and uh, we are supposed to develop an implementing agreement uh, of this uh, UNCLOS um, convention. So there are uh, four pillars of negotiation in this uh, respect. We have a pillar that uh, aims to establish a global framework for 
um, the ABMTs, uh, it was area-based management tools, including MPAs. The second one is also to establish a general framework for the impact assessment, uh, environmental impact assessment in ABNJ. The third one regards the establishment of an access uh, regime for marine genetic resources and the benefit sharing arising from their utilization. And finally, uh, the last pillar regards the capacity building and the transfer of technology uh, for uh, mainly for developing countries. And we have also an additional one, cross-cutting issues, which relates to the whole structure of the agreement. So. Excellent. Well done. A plus for that. Uh, Anka, you've done extremely well. Thank you so very much, Anka. That was really an excellent summary of uh, the BBNJ process, which is uh, about biodiversity, conservation, and sustainable use of resources in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, and, and then I think one of the biggest challenges I faced uh, as I got involved at the later stage as well myself is persuading countries such as mine, Eritrea, who is a very small country, and other LDCs as well, to actively engage in the process. And of course, the obvious response was, is it, is it too remote to matter? We're talking about beyond 200 nautical miles. We can hardly ever exploit or utilize our resources only a mile or two from our coastal line. And why should we engage, or why should we be interested in areas of human jurisdiction? And for me, with this slight marine biology background, who understands the interconnectedness of the ocean system, um, I immediately uh, ran into, uh, I, I went to Katia for help, and I said, can we demonstrate that the high seas, or the health, or the resilience of the high seas do in fact matter for coastal ecosystems, with the resilience and the livelihoods of coastal communities as well? And that's where I think, Katia, I do would like to take this opportunity to congratulate Katia, by the way. We've just submitted a paper to the Journal of Marine Policy, which, which just got accepted as well. And uh, congratulations on that, uh, Katia. Uh, so can you tell our audience, Katia, if you don't mind, uh, in brief, about the work that you did on ecological connectivity between the high seas and coastal waters, and why the high seas matter, essentially, for coastal communities? Katia, over to you. Yeah, Sam, you are absolutely right. When we are looking at the high seas from coastal perspective, the high seas seem to be very remote and kind of a bit inconsequential, really. At the first glance, uh, nothing to be further from the truth because we have growing scientific uh, evidence coming from various directions that ecologically, high seas are very much connected uh, to the coastal zones. And uh, key uh, lines of evidence come probably from two major directions. The first direction is migratory nature of a lot of marine species who spend some time in the high seas, some time in the coastal zone. And very often they migrate through corridors. So if you disturb the key points along those corridors, so species which come immediately to mind in this respect is, you know, absolutely iconic like sharks or leatherback turtles, which have not only socioeconomic significance but cultural significance as well. So that is one one line of evidence which keep coming and uh, kind of keep coming fast and furious with development of new uh, tracking technologies. And another line of evidence, which is kind of more my kind of uh, native area of expertise, let's say, it's a connectivity through ocean circulation. So we all know that ocean currents do exist, but people don't often realize how fast and vigorous these ocean currents are and how tightly they connect high seas to the coastal zones and on what short time scale. I mean, we're talking about, if you imagine just throwing millions of imaginary rubber ducks from every single area of high seas, in about one month onward, you will begin to catch those rubber ducks at the coastal zones. 
So, and not all high seas are made equal. So some are more important, some areas are much more connected than the other. And if some you would like to show that map, we built one map as an example. So if we consider <coughs> throwing those yellow ducks and sending people catching them up after six months, how many countries will be connected to each point of the high seas, which will give you an example of why you should not be disturbing anything with potential negative Great. impacts. Great. No, thank you very much, um, Katya. Um, I'm not sure about the color of the is not really. Uh, it looks better there if you can come and have a look here. But. Um, I don't know, something is not right by, on the screen. Uh, nonetheless, I think it was very important. Uh, I, I like the, the analogy that they used about the use of rubber ducks. Uh, by the way, they are virtual rubber ducks, so uh, just to make it clear. So when I, I challenged uh, you know, Katya to explain to me in layman's language in terms of you know, how, how do you do the modeling work, and essentially the language she used was you, know, you just release these virtual rubber ducks and you just you just follow them, you know, how far they travel over a given period of time. And that's essentially to highlight the, I mean, the, the connectivity between coastal waters and the high seas. So sadly, what you cannot really necessarily see, um, I mean, it's, it's not too bad, actually. Uh, yeah, it, it yeah. does show. It's, it's yeah. unfortunately pink time scale, pink scales, color scales. But what it meant to show is that there are areas which are on this time scale of six months connects to really a large number of least developed countries. So we have uh, areas around Mascarene Plateau in the Indian Ocean, we have that donut hole of Pacific Islands, and we have that East Africa, uh, West Africa block, which are very, very important because of the number of countries they connect on a exactly. very short time scale. Exactly. And if we cannot protect the whole yeah. kind of, uh, all the entirety mm. of high seas, and yeah. if we need to be selective, yeah. there are certain areas which are yeah. much more influential. Absolutely. Precisely that. So, um, one of the sort of the points, as Anka mentioned earlier, is about um, um, one of the pillars, of course, is about the area-based management tools, including marine protected areas. And of course, in, 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 the the devil is in the detail, as they say. Uh, and the point is, then, how do you decide which area should be protected? Of course, uh, protecting closing off the entire high seas may not necessarily be politically palatable, and therefore you have to have a certain criteria in identifying which area should be protected and uh, or should be given more priority. And the obvious, uh, the, the conventional wisdom is about uh, um, uh, the ecologically and biologically significant areas in terms of you know, which ones are the biodiversity hotspots. But through this work that Katya did, what we're trying to highlight is which are the areas that are of utmost significance to least developed countries. Therefore, in addition to the ecological and biological significance, let's look at the the socioeconomic significance as well. So if we were to prioritize, as Katya said, then which areas should we prioritize? And that's, I think that's exactly, this highlights the deep color, the deep pink or red colors that you see are areas of uh, high socioeconomic significance, if you like, also biological significance, of course, for uh, a number of uh, least developed countries. Um, uh, I would like to bring in William, uh, following Katya here. So, William, I, I guess I think the, the work that you do is fascinating about the climate change because we're talking about the high seas governance, but how do we future proof it? Because if we were to factor in climate change, we could potentially undermine our conservation efforts or even potentially undermine the potential benefits that we may accrue from uh, economic activities in the high seas. Then what happens when you factor in uh, uh, climate change? And that's when, by the way, uh, I, I'm giving very wrong impression about myself. My job seems to be about running to people seeking for information. Uh, so then that's when I went directly to William in saying that, you know, um, what's, I mean, how can uh, A, climate change undermine uh, activities in the high seas, but also how could climate change affect uh, fisheries in the high seas and poss possibly in the coastal area as well through potential money. Can you just elaborate a bit more about that, uh, William, if you don't mind? Sure, maybe uh, you can show sure, that. Sure, sure, sure. 
You know, I think um, besides the, the, uh, the kind of physical oceanographic connectivities that Katia mentioned, there's also the, uh, the biological connectivities and the fishery connectivities between the high seas and uh, the coastal area, which is also really important. Um, and um, this is particularly important for many um, tropical or developing countries where um, they are strongly dependent on fish, um, not only for their livelihood but also for their health. Um, for example, that map that I show on the right hand side, on the left hand side on the screen, that is uh, a study that we previously did looking at um, the nutritional de dependence of different uh, countries uh, on fish as a major source of micronutrients such as same omega fatty acids. Um, and uh, those countries that are highlighted with uh, reticular shows that uh, it means uh, if there is a decrease in fish supply, uh, it, there's a high risk of uh, malnutrition in those countries. Um, so you can see that many of those countries are uh, developing countries along the tropics, such as in West Africa, uh, in Asia Pacific regions, um, and in South Pacific islands. And this particular work, um, we look at how climate change will affect uh, the uh, fish and fisheries, and so looking at how that may uh, particularly affect uh, some of these countries who are currently highly dependent on fish for their food, for their livelihood. Um, climate change is, uh, has effects has no boundary, no matter the fish is in the high sea or in EEZ. But in this particular case, uh, we focus on uh, fish dogs um, uh, that are exploited by the high sea fisheries, and majority of them, almost all of them, actually a straddling stock, uh, which means that uh, they actually uh, move uh, the stock share between high sea and EZ. They are not exclusively high seas. So it means that uh, some countries are catching the fish both within their uh, territorial waters as well in the high seas. And the proportions actually differ, uh, particularly for some of the developing countries. Majority of the catch that are straddlings, they catch it in the EZ. So what we look at is uh, we develop future scenarios of uh, what would happen in these fisheries under different climate change scenarios. And particularly, we look at um, the high emission and low emission scenarios. Um, the two scenarios are shown on the left hand, right hand side of the screen, which I use the sea surface temperature as an example to, to give you a contrast of the two scenarios. One is the business as usual scenario that gives you around three degrees increase in global sea surface temperature, and then a uh, a, a scenario that's close to the Paris Agreement that can limit uh, ocean warming to around uh, one degree Celsius. And what we find is that climate change really would have a big effect on uh, high sea fisheries. Uh, it affects the distribution of fish stocks, it affects the productivity. And particularly um, for, um, uh, for the high sea fish catches, uh, we project, for example, with a business as usual scenario, it reduced fish catch by almost 70% compared to the uh, uh, Paris Agreement scenario. Uh, the biodiversity will also be reduced substantially by more than 20%. Um, also, if we look at the low-income countries, and um, particularly if we assume that um, they are catching fish stocks that are, uh, that are, uh, that are important, they are also important for the high seas, uh, there is also a substantial decrease in their um, economic benefits, which is uh, over 30%. And uh, we then try to explore various high sea governance scenario and uh, management scenario. So we actually convene a expert group, uh, SAM was there, and then we also bring in other, uh, other colleagues uh, who work on different aspects like uh, international law, uh, economics, or biology, to kind of develop what the future changes in high sea fisheries and the society will be like. So we developed three ocean futures for the high seas. Um, and uh, there are a few things that are quite important um, that we, we, we find is worthwhile to highlight. First of all, um, in the, all the scenarios, business as usual, as I mentioned, um, there will be big impacts on the high sea fisheries, both in terms of the economics as well as in the biology. And secondly, economically, um, by we develop the scenarios and look at changes by, uh, by the next few decades, by 2050s. Um, we find that um, the economic viability of all the three ocean futures are actually in doubt. Um, and uh, they are, um, they, uh, they, they, economically, they don't perform well for various reasons. Um, in some cases, uh, it's maybe because of the de low demand for fish, because people shift their diet. In other cases, uh, it's because of the high impacts of climate change and overfishing. But um, 
the third one which relates to governance and conservation is that uh, the conservations of the high seas, uh, if we do it effectively, um, it actually benefits the coastal states, particularly for the tropical countries that are, are affected by, uh, by climate change quite severely. And um, <coughs> the reason for that is that uh, we look at a number of scenarios for high sea governance. Um, like there are more uh, reduction in fishing efforts uh, because of reduction in capacity, reduction in subsidies. We also have scenarios of protecting high, the high sea substantially, 30% or 50%. Uh, what we find is that uh, with those uh, protections uh, or reduction in fishing effort in the high sea, there will be increase in catches relative to the weapons scenario where it is business as usual, uh, as well as a um, uh, increase in biodiversity. And the reason is that these fish stocks are straddling, as I mentioned, because they, they, uh, they, they move beyond, be, between high seas and the EZ. So when they build up the biomass in the high seas, um, that actually benefits uh, the EZ. And that is in agreement with some of the earlier studies that, for example, Rashid and I have been doing um, in looking at high sea governance and, and climate change. But this time, we particularly look at some of the more uh, uh, additions of the ocean futures that relates to the future projections of uh, changes in the society, as well as these uh, alternative governance measures uh, with different level of management and conservation. And uh, that come up with this conclusion. Thank you very much, William. That's fantastic. I think uh, I immensely enjoyed sort of you know w working with you, William, on this. It was really fantastic. Uh, um, I, I guess the, what really struck me uh, when I look at the modelling results were two things. In particular, one is under any given future scenario of the high seas governance or the ocean governance, fishing in the high seas is by no means economically viable. Is that a correct assessment, William? Yeah. Um, so uh, from our modelling studies, exactly. um, and is it. There, there is a, mm. a, a um, some. Uh, it is based on the assumption that we made. Uh, yeah. Other studies, like Washit had uh, was called in the studies yeah. earlier on, uh, they estimated mm. a more uh, a little bit more optimistic uh, yeah. economic viability uh, based on some uh, assumptions about the economic side of sure. things. But also in addition to uh, that, I think uh, one of the mm. additions mm. from previous study that we did yeah. is uh, we look at how the society would change in the future. Yeah. You mentioned that. Uh, it, which uh, now do not have a big high sea fishery. Yeah. But then we look at also the scenarios where, for example, some of the low-income countries may continue to develop, yeah. and they may actually develop an aspiration for high sea uh, fishing in the future. True. So we take that into account and how that would then affect uh, yeah. the, uh, some of the changes in, uh, in fishing effort and things sure. like that. Uh, sure. and, and accounting for all this, yes, yeah. we find that uh, across all the three ocean yeah. futures that we look at, yeah. uh, none of them are economically viable. Bio -bio. Yeah. Thank you so very much, William. Uh, I think, uh, let me get back to you, uh, uh, Anka Lavoy here. Uh, I'm taking pride in pronouncing your last name very correctly, by the way. Lavoy. Lavoy. How do you pronounce your last name, uh, Anka? <laughs> I'm sorry, I do have a problem with French names. It's great. Uh, Nothing personal. <laughs> Thank you um, so much. Yeah. Uh, so I guess what, we, what we're learning from here is the ocean is a highly interconnected uh, system, ecologically uh, speaking. Uh, but also the, you know, the activities in the high seas certainly affect the, the resilience or the well-being of coastal communities, in particular in developing countries. So um, from a legal perspective, um, is it... How realistic is it to divide up the ocean into different legal uh, regimes? So I, I would have two points, two reactions for the uh, sure. please, work that please, has been Anka. just submitted. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much mm. for your uh, input and uh, for this clarification. Um, I am extremely happy to be part of these discussions because for us as negotiators and policy makers, if I can say like that, uh, mm. Um, it's extremely important to have uh, really your feedback um, because we are first of all creating new legal provisions mm. in uh, a future treaty mm. and um, I must say that I'm extremely surprised but not really surprised about these new elements that we'll have to face. The, uh, first of all this interconnectivity and also I wanted to react on, on your explanations on climate change and ocean. This is something uh, mm. a little bit else uh, mm. compared to, to, to um, the legal issues within the BBNJ process. 
uh, we do really uh, have a lot of challenges uh, there, uh, more particularly on the pillar of, of the access to marine genetic resources, including fish, because fish is also uh, one of the types of, of marine genetic resources. And um, indeed, legally, we will have a very big challenge because as you might know, EEZ and continental shells uh, are already covered by an international instrument that is called the Nagoya Protocol, which is an implementing agreement um, to the Convention on Biological Diversity, and uh, which have very specific provisions. If I take the example in France, as you know, it's a maritime uh, country. We have a very specific uh, provision for EEZ and continental shells, and we will have to ensure legal coherence between the two systems. And I think it will be extremely challenging uh, for us and also for the users. Um, now, if we are speaking about our discussions within the BBNJ process, of course, um, and uh, this is also the French position, I can say it. Um, we uh, consider uh, the high seas, we, 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 we have to have a pragmatic approach there. We do not have the intention to touch to the legal uh, status of marine genetic resources because, first of all, it is not possible, as you have already explained, uh, with all these uh, changes. Uh, and, and, and to uh, focus very clearly our discussions on the benefit sharing and, and to see how we can put in place a system uh, that has to be uh, workable, pragmatic, but also balanced and, and, f and to be also to the benefit of all nations, as you said uh, also, because this is something that is key. And we, uh, in France, at least the scientists, have also uh, an approach uh, concerning the ocean as an ecosystem. And uh, they do not see all these differences, legal differences, even if we cannot just ignore this, because this is the current international law. But we have to be inventive, and we count on you also as some, to bring some sure. new ideas on, sure. on that. Uh, so, Issues. talking about new ideas, um, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, um, we, we, we talk about uh, the, the principle of common heritage of mankind applying to marine resources in the high seas. Uh, I'm very uh, pleased that you, you mentioned about marine genetic resources, including fish and other marine organisms. And uh, um, the idea of uh, applying the principle of common heritage of mankind is essentially saying that the, the ocean resource in areas of national jurisdiction uh, uh, belongs to everyone and should benefit everyone essentially. No one can have a, a, an ownership over uh, the, the resources. Does that resonate with your thinking? <coughs> uh, or, or in terms of, because you said being a bit innovative, the reason why I'm pressing Anka on this is because it's a highly divisive issue. Uh, Julian is giving me a wink there because he knows how complex this issue is. Uh, it divides uh, countries' opinions. And I think it would be really great to, for our audience to benefit from your opinion about the common heritage of mankind or if there was any element of innovation that could probably meet the demands of many as well in the negotiation rooms. Well, first of all, regarding the negotiations, I, as I know, as you said, that uh, I, I don't have formal instructions on that. I uh, however, I would like to remind the fact that common heritage of mankind apply to mineral resources, and this principle does not apply to marine genetic resources. And I wanted also to remind that marine genetic resources as such uh, are not... Um, uh, mentioned in UNCLOS, which is also an important element when we have to argue from a legal point of view, you know, the, the legal status. Um, however, I, uh, <coughs> my, my own opinion, uh, because I have also worked on that just for my own understanding of that issue before being involved in all this uh, more, let's say, uh, delicate discussions in the negotiations. Um, I personally consider the ocean as an ecosystem. I'm not, uh, I do not see 
the principle of common heterotroph mankind applying only to marine genetic resources, because to me the ocean is an ecosystem. However, uh, uh, in my, in my um, reflection, uh, I also see the difficulty that uh, has this uh, principle to be, to be applied within the whole ocean ecosystem. So to me, uh, I do really see uh, another concept that uh, French scientists are reflecting on it beyond national jurisdiction, which is uh, l'océan bien commun de l'humanité, uh, which is uh, translated into English uh, ocean as a common or a common good or a global common, uh, which involves in fact a common responsibility uh, uh, for the protection and the conservation uh, of, of the ocean and, uh, and ha that has to benefit to all nations, not only to some of, of them, uh, and this is something that I uh, would see, uh, of course, and as I said, uh, in the Paris Agreement we managed to have uh, the reference to the ocean ecosystem in the preambular text, so Paris Agreement, which is also a treaty. Sure. Uh, I think it's also uh, an important element to, to, to bear in mind and also to build on this within our discussions, maybe Excellent. in the BB&J uh, discussions. So, uh, this being said, uh, marine genetic resources, common heritage of mankind, this is something that is extremely difficult to envisage for this negotiation, and now I'm speaking as a pure lawyer, uh, because it would involve the modification of UNCLOS, while we don't have a mandate from the UN to negotiate uh, the opening of this convention. Legally speaking, this is something that is feasible if we have a mandate. So if all UN countries agree to have a mandate to reopen uh, UNCLOS as it has been done with part 11 uh, in 1995, uh, this is not unfeasible. But I had also a reflection on the political momentum for, for, for this future agreement, we really are very committed, at least in France and at the EU level also, to have an agreement by 2020. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was very happy to hear uh, the, the statement by the Swedish minister who said that we have to act now, not tomorrow. You know, a lot of people and a lot of con uh, experts, countries, sure are saying, well, are we going to handle for 2020, maybe 2022? No, we have a mandate, we have to stick with the mandate, sure. and we have to believe that we can do it. Sure. So I think Obviously. that it's important. To no, I think it's a very humbling statement. That's a very good point uh, you make, Anka. Uh, I mean, of course, you know, uh, striking a deal takes, uh, you know, ha having the political will to make uh, compromises, etc. as well, of course. Uh, 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 but just to get back, to, to, to Katia. Um, so I guess one of the sort of uh, the elements that we didn't necessarily look at the study was sort of the, again, to go back to the climate change impact as well in terms of how it would impact circulation and connectivity, etc. To what extent do you see climate change being, of course, this, we haven't really analyzed this data yet, but uh, if, the, if you foresee any potential impact of climate change in impacting the migratory um, connectivity and uh, water circulation, etc., and how would that potentially undermine our effort to govern the high seas, for instance? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So everything is uh, beginning to change right now. So we have uh, species getting on the move to adjust to new climatic characteristics and also ocean, ocean physics, ocean dynamic is responding. So uh, ocean currents are beginning to shift, uh, which impacts this uh, our pink map, uh, so those important areas begin to shift. So everything is shifting. It's not shifting randomly, yeah. it's shifting quite predictably. Sure. So we can monitor, definitely, yeah. we can project mm -hmm. those shifts, mm -hmm. but what is important kind of to get mm -hmm. into our mm -hmm. consciousness is that 
when we design in MPAs mm. and anything, we should think of them as areas with flexible boundaries. Can you elaborate a bit more on that? Because Absolutely. Those boundaries, boundaries will begin to move, mm. again, not randomly. They will begin to move quite coherently. Mm. But we need, from the beginning, to mm. build in that those boundaries will be shifting. Nothing mm. is nailed yeah. in space, yeah. especially in the ocean. Ocean is much more different from terrestrial environment. Mm. Species move, find their new niches, these niches carry on moving. Mm -hmm. yes. So everything is on the move, we're sure. dealing with a kind of moving sure. planet. Sure. Presumably, I mean, you're absolutely right in saying that um, we you cannot necessarily have and just a static MPA out there because it will keep, things will change and as a result we need to be more adaptive essentially, and presumably that message also resonates with the, our business models for the business sector as well maybe, in terms of the risks will change and... Uh, Absolutely, yeah. yes, so those adaptive measurements mm. must kind of include very specifically mentioned mm. flexible moving boundaries, sure. that's put quite a lot of pressure sure. on the monitoring sure. okay. and the predictive uh, sure. studies of these okay. boundaries. Great. Fantastic, Katya. Uh, I, I guess I have uh, uh, one question for um, uh, William. Uh, when we talk about climate change, its impact, there's of course so much doom and gloom, of course. Uh, but from your analysis, uh, William, do you see any winners? And if so, who are they? Or Yes, uh, as Kathy mentioned, um, a lot of the fish stock shift under climate change is quite predictable. And many of the fish stocks shift uh, is, for example, shifting to um, the uh, tourist poles, a high latitude region, uh, because uh, the f as the oceans warms up, um, the fish try to find area where uh, temperatures are a bit cooler and can maintain their preferred temperature. So that's often in uh, high latitude regions where ocean temperatures tend to be cooler than the tropical area. So in this case, uh, as the fish stocks move up, then uh, the countries in the temperate and uh, high latitude regions uh, tends to actually get more of those fish. Uh, so we are already seeing some of these uh, shifts. Uh, for example, uh, there was a study that shows that tuna stocks uh, range expand um, their range of tuna are uh, more temperate region now. Um, there are also other, many other examples that uh, are showing that some of the fish stocks are moving into the Arctic. Yeah. Um, so in this case, we look at uh, the abundance potential, potential catch of the fish stocks. Mm -hmm. It does show that uh, latitudinal gradient, where the tropical area is the, uh, the, 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 the losing catch potential, right. in some area quite substantially, right. more than 50%, yeah. while some of the high latitude regions yeah. um, is projected to increase in catch. Sure. Just a follow up to that, because I think I can see Michel Lay sitting there in front of me, um, and what he highlighted earlier is very important. We're talking about small scale fisheries or small and medium enterprises in developing countries which according to you study are most likely going to lose out because they are in the in the in the uh, is that lower tropics yeah mm. the lower latitude rather yeah so um, if you were to suggest something very radical that would sustain the livelihood of Michel or his business and people like him in the tropical area what would that radical change be yeah I think um, there were um, two aspects of changes that are needed. First of all, um, currently a lot of the fisheries are not uh, optimally managed, so they are actually are less productive than they can. So by, we, we, um, by maintaining their productivities through better management, rebuilding of fish stocks, uh, it can help in uh, reducing the impacts. Uh, and uh, there are already studies that demonstrate that. Uh, and, and secondly, is to actually try to um, um, create this um, abundance of fish stocks that can help with, um, with um, uh, increasing the productivity further. So in this case, uh, in the case of high seas, what we find is that uh, building up uh, a um, high, uh, better maintaining this uh, straddling or migratory fish stocks, then can, uh, for example, help with coastal states where um, they, uh, even though they don't have to go to the high seas, they can still uh, uh, get uh, a better share of these uh, uh, shuttling fish stocks within the EZ. Uh, and, um, and then thirdly, is uh, also about thinking of um, the um, 
better diversifications of the way they get um, their food and, uh, and nutrition. So I think uh, if, I mean, the best case scenario is that uh, we will go to Paris Agreement, uh, we will achieve the Paris Agreement targets um, and that the impacts will be managed in, a, will be in a manageable uh, level. Uh, mm -hmm. But if we go to a business as usual scenario where the impacts can be quite substantial, uh, um, then uh, we need to think about how we can help with um, with, with uh, diversifying the, um, the the source of food, the sources for incomes, to further moderate and reduce that impact. And in this case, uh, societal development is really important. Sure. Uh, so I've been given much by uh, Gillian there. Uh, are we opening the for, for question and answer? Or? Yes. Um, yeah. If it's okay for our panelists, I'd like to give you the top three questions that have come um, from the poll everywhere. And so maybe I'll give them to you, and then you can parcel parcel them out. Um, let's. We'll go for questions, and then at the end, maybe I can ask you to give us some of the key messages from the panel. So let me give you all a moment to have a look at the poll everywhere questions. We've got some 28 or so questions. You can toggle back and forth between top and new. Um, have a look at those and see if there are any you want to give some points to, and then I'm going to ask the panel the top three. So let me pause for just a moment. Ooh, the numbers are going up. They're going up. <laughs> All right. I'll start with the first one. How realistic is at sea enforcement on the high seas in terms of the law? How realistic is at sea enforcement on the high seas in terms of the law, the expense, and the effectiveness? So, I guess the question I think probably if we uh, Anka maybe first is uh, about the monitoring of uh, suppose how do you monitor and police the high seas and given it's very vast and. Uh, I, I'm not sure I, I will understood uh, the question. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Could you kindly repeat it? Maybe, maybe it's by English. I don't the know. question is about enforcement. Isn't it? Yeah. About how how realistic force? is at sea enforcement yeah. on the high seas mm -hmm. in terms of G generally or regarding the our the high seas. Yeah. Well, uh, we have a quite established principle, which is the flag state. Uh, responsibility. We will have to challenge this within the BBNJ negotiations because there we will have to ensure that scientists under the flag state or under the nationality of the institution rather than the, than the individual uh, uh, is going to fulfill their obligations with the future treaty. So um, yeah, how effective this could be, we will have to have also a compliance, uh, a compliance mechanism to be able to ensure that, uh, and uh, it will be very complex, but before speaking about compliance, we have to be all uh, on the same page on the obligations that we will have to fulfill first and second uh, to uh, be also ambitious in terms of um, of uh, responsibility of states very clearly i think yeah. okay sure. the next question is how can we avoid the issue of rfmos having a lack of capacity and will to enforce conservation and management measures when these must be approved by the rfmo members who are often the major fishers on the high seas that's, that's for you, I think. Really? <laughs> I, 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 would, I, would, I wouldn't feel comfortable taking that question, please. Uh, again, uh, I think it's also, um, I guess, um, there, there, was, there was, I remember once we, we, we spent hours and hours and hours in the, in the windowless, uh, gigantic room in the, in the UN headquarters uh, talking about the word undermining. So how do we make sure we don't undermine uh, regional fisheries management organizations? How do we avoid undermining other uh, treaties such as CBD and close? How do we still undermine? I, I think um, we, this is a new legally binding instrument. This is my own perspective, by the way. Uh, and uh, as a result, um, we, we need to work to a, uh, towards a developing a global uh, legal tool to govern biodiversity in the high seas. Because the status quo at the moment you have is RFMOs. I'm not saying RFMOs are not doing a great job, probably they're doing a good job. However, the, 
that, that means it's very patchy. So what we need is a shift towards a more um, a global instrument. Uh, and for me, that doesn't necessarily translate into undermining these, uh, if that answers the question that is. Yeah. And can you remind us what RFMOs are? So these are the regional fisheries management organizations. To give an example, you have one in the Mediterranean, for instance, you would have one in the Western Indian Ocean or the Pacific, etc. So these are sort of uh, regional uh, bodies that govern uh, struggling fish stocks or, you know, or, um, yeah, or common uh, resource pools. Yeah. So we just got called on acronym use. So from now on, yeah, yeah. no big acronyms, unless yeah. you're willing to uh, yeah. say what they are. Maybe uh, the person who wrote the question yeah. is our focus. Maybe if I can add something to sure. that, um, undermining or not. In fact, the, the, the real issue uh, and the challenge uh, we have in these discussions is, is how to avoid to interfere with the mandates of this uh, instruments because in these regional parts you have also legal instruments that are impacted yeah. and um, in the new draft that we have received we have four options and among which we have another very interesting one which which uh, suggests to be mutually supportive yeah. uh, which could maybe uh, be a one of the alternatives in order to to support what it is done and also that at the regional level they could do all the management things in order not to uh, to interfere with the mandates, with the legal mandates. Sure. Uh, because the, the, the real problem is that not all parties to the future agreement are party to these regional instruments, mm -hmm. so the global level cannot impose measures to the to the regional level. But also vice versa. Legal uh, terms. The Potentially, countries can be parties to the new instrument, but not necessarily being parties to the clause. Eritrea, good example. Right. Okay. Let's take the third. Um, the third question that came that's the third highest. How can we use, whoops, I just moved. <laughs> you guys are still voting. How can we use market based approaches to incentivize better governance of high seas where direct regulation, command, and control might fail? Um, so, William and Katia, would you want to jump into that in terms of uh, could there be some uh, incentive based tools or instruments that could incentivize good practice in the high seas where command and control fail? Yeah, I think um, it's um, <coughs> some of the main issues that um, in the high sea fisheries is because of subsidies, uh, and uh, that actually uh, makes uh, some of the uh, fisheries that are not. Um, Economic viable to become viable because of the, the subsidies. So I think uh, if if um, there is a uh, the intentions to eliminate the subsidies, then I think it will provide a kind of a, a economic consequence. It, it may not be incentive, but the consequence that uh, the fishing effort level will will be reduced and um, and the reduction in fishing capacity um, is one uh, big contribution to uh, more uh, sustainable fisheries in the high seas. Katya, can I invite you to come in? Um, no, sorry, yes, I'm that's okay. Yeah, okay, sure. Answer for your area. No, no, I mean, I, I'm refraining from saying much because I think this is a very interesting question, particularly for tomorrow, as we discuss about subsidies, etc. The reason why I'm emphasizing on subsidies is, um, I think, it's partly because um, I, I don't think without subsidies we could have fishing activities going on in the high seas, for instance. You know, if you eliminate uh, subsidies particularly the harmful subsidies, then that means you're doing a good job. I mean, enabling sort of the same management of uh, the high seas. But I think that's a very exciting topic for tomorrow, so I don't want to keep uh, in much. Yeah. Excellent. So we yeah. have about 10 minutes left. There were 28 or 29 other great questions on there. So actually, we're going to open the floor now for about 10 minutes to see if you put a question on you're specifically keen on, or if another question is, um, has kind of bubbled up in your mind. And then SM will let you close out with some sure. key messages. So we've got some microphones just beside you. Please introduce yourself. Hi there, I'm uh, Mr. Olivier Yambo. I'm from the Center for Marine Ecological Resilience and Geological Resources, a center based at Nottingham Trent University, Nottingham Law School. That's where I come from. Um, today, uh, Thank you first for uh, the very interesting discussion we had so far on uh, BBNG. Um, this is my area of speciality, 
by the way. Mm. <laughs> so it makes sense that I'm uh, asking a question on that. Of the ocean, particularly as we discussed about the high seas, but of course the, 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 the legal uh, complexity as well that we have to tackle at the same time. Um, uh, but I guess uh, there's undisputed fact, I might say, though, that they, as remote as they may seem the high seas, they are so relevant and so important for coastal communities and economies, and I'm talking about particularly, I'm not saying exclusively, but particularly for developing countries uh, that are already facing a number of economic and climatic shocks. So the health of the high seas is extremely important for, the, for these communities to thrive and to be more resilient as well. Uh, I think that's a very important point uh, to make. Um, uh, but, but I guess I think the other, the elephant in the room, as we refer to it all the time, is about the issue of uh, climate change as well. How could climate change potentially undermine both the conservation and sustainable use of the high seas? And therefore, whatever treaty we come up with in the end of the day, we have to make sure that treaty is climate or future proof. So we need to take into account the issue of climate change uh, very uh, seriously. Uh, and I, I was really uh, uh, motivated, I might say, or well, very pleased uh, uh, with that very encouraging statement that Anka made as well about we need to act now, we have the mandate to agree on a treaty, well not necessarily, so at least we have a mandate after 2020 to reach into some sort of agreement, let's make it happen. How do we make that happen? By, I think there are more progressive nations in the room, as you go to negotiation rooms, than those who are seen as antagonists. So I think so long as the progressive blocs or you know, countries come together to work together to iron out differences and agree on the legally binding instrument, uh, I tend to share your ambition. I think that might possibly be achievable. So on that note, let me thank our distinguished panelists and please join me in uh, um, thanking my colleagues here, William, Patrick.